my name is Lily Peng. Uh, as the um, video shows, I am from Google. Uh, there I am a product manager. Um, I was originally a physician, um, much like uh, many of you will be soon, um, but I've been repurposed as a product manager at Google. So I'm gonna start off by telling you a little bit about what I do at Google, and then um, I'll uh, go into a little bit more about how I got there. Um, but to, to start with, uh, I'd like to talk about uh, some of the projects that we um, are working on uh, in the research group in applying what we call deep learning to medical imaging. Uh, and one particular disease that we've been uh, working on is diabetic retinopathy. So what is diabetic retinopathy? Well, um, it is uh, one of the most common complications of uh, diabetes. It affects 450 million um, diabetic patients worldwide, and uh, every, uh, pa uh, every uh, of these patients should be screened once a year uh, for the disease. Um, and this is accomplished by taking a picture on the back of the eye with the special camera on the left there, uh, and it takes a picture of uh, the retina, and uh, it produces an image like that. Each of these images are then graded um, on a five-point scale. There are actually many grading systems, but the most common one is a five-point scale, and is graded from uh, uh, no DR to the end stage, which is proliferative disease. And doctors generally look for um, very fine lesions, uh, hemorrhages, microaneurysms, things that are actually quite easy to miss. So unfortunately, in many parts of the world, uh, there are just simply not enough specialists to do this task. Um, for example, in India, this is where kind of our story started, there's a shortage of 127,000 uh, eye doctors. And as a result, um, about half the patients suffer some form of uh, vision loss before they're uh, diagnosed with a disease. And of course, this is a preventable um, disorder, and so therefore this is basically a never event. So um, a group of us actually uh, visited um, one of the couple of hospitals in India and saw that there was a need here and that we thought, well, maybe this is a place that we could help. So uh, partnering uh, with a couple of um, eye hospitals in India, as well as a teleophthalmology provider in the US, um, we got a lot of images uh, from them and we, got, uh, we built a labeling tool, and we hired 54 ophthalmologists to render um, 880,000 diagnoses on about 130,000 images. And then uh, these images were graded, as I uh, mentioned, on this five-point scale, and we trained what we called a deep neural network to read these images. Now, um, deep learning is a really efficient way of training um, algorithms that do not require rules to be um, uh, explicitly written. So instead of telling the machine what to look for, we basically give them lots and lots of examples. In this case, about 130,000 examples and about a million grades. Um, and the reason we had to actually grade so much was, as um, you can imagine, doctors' opinions uh, differ, and we had a lot of, we had a, quite a bit of variability in grading. So. Anyway, so we trained using this uh, set of data set. Um, we put it through a pretty well-known um, neural net called Inception. Uh, this, is, this has been used at Google to train image recognition algorithms for a variety of products, including photos. And so, you know, it used to categorize cats and dogs, and now we retrained it to look and read fundus photos. Uh, and uh, the network predicted, of course, the five-point grades, but it also predicted what we call housekeeping, um, uh, housekeeping predictions, like the left right or right eye, or whether or not this image is of gradable quality. Let's see, okay, there we go. And then we built a tool, uh, this a front end, for doctors in India to upload images and give a grade back. So here is a drag and drop. It's kind of like a toaster. You put in a picture, we give you a diagnosis. Uh, and so uh, we. Uh, these are, this is actual, um, an actual screenshot of the tool. Uh, and then we, um, we published a paper recently um, at the end of last year about how, this, how well this works in, in, in aggregate. Uh, and um, as you can see, this is one of the main figures in the journal, uh, in the publication. Uh, sensitivity is on the y-axis, one minus specificity is on the x-axis, uh, and um, the 
ophthalmologists are represented in the color dots. The algorithm is a black line. Uh, and you can see we get really, really close to ophthalmologist performance here. Um, in fact, if you look at the F-score, which is uh, a measure of both sensitivity and specificity, we are just a little bit better than the median ophthalmologist. And so, you know, we actually uh, got pretty good reviews here, um, both by a couple of doctors from, um, from Harvard, but also uh, University of Adelaide here, one of our favorite quotes, um, where, uh, you know, they said we live up to the hype. It's <laughs> pretty awesome. So, uh, so what's next? We showed that this algorithm works pretty well in, uh, in a publication, obviously, but um, there's a lot more to do to bring algorithms like these or technology like these uh, into the clinic. Um, so first of all, uh, clinical trials. Um, as I alluded to, this algorithm is being studied in clinical studies with our partners in India, Arvind and Sankara. We're also talking with the FDA and regulatory agencies about um, the algorithm and how to deploy it in such a way that is um, compliant with regulations. We're also partnering because, you know, while our group is, you know, a research group that we train algorithms, we don't build hardware, uh, and we're not necessarily a life sciences company. So we work with an alphabet company, a sister company um, of Google called Verily. Um, we also have a partnership with Nikon, and they, they'll make uh, the retinal cameras uh, so that uh, the idea is that the, there's, you know, that uh, hardware itself will be easy to use and uh, not present itself as a barrier to, um, to getting screened. So, uh, so that's the story about diabetic ret retinopathy, but as you can imagine, this type of technology will work pretty well on all sorts of medical imaging. So another application of this is in cancer biopsies, so in um, histology. Um, and uh, this is a, these are pretty well known, I think, statistics where um, the variability in grading uh, manifests itself in what we think um, uh, misdiagnoses in the way that you interpret uh, histology samples. So there's uh, some sobering numbers, about one in 12 bi uh, breast biopsies may be misdiagnosed, and th these numbers are similar uh, for pr prostate cancer and other sorts of cancers because it's quite difficult to actually read some of these um, slides. And in fact, uh, if you're a pathologist, um, you're, so each one of these slides, if you digitize them, is equivalent to 10 gigapixels. So that's like, I don't know, albums of pictures. And you're supposed to examine these on a cellular level uh, and not miss anything. <laughs> so it's really difficult. And um, uh, there's a lot of information to go through. And so this is yet another place where we thought, an algorithm could probably be pretty helpful here. Um, so uh, this, in, in this case, we used um, breast cancer uh, uh, sentinel lymph nodes, and um, we trained an algorithm that localizes where we think the metastasis was. So uh, panel A is the biopsy image, completely really zoomed out, uh, and B is the ground truth mass, so where the tumor is. So if you actually look at that area, it's a pretty small met there, and you have to go find that um, as a pathologist, so it's not an easy task. Um, and what we did was we trained an algorithm that, uh, that localizes the tumor for you. So C is uh, one of the early predictions that we, um, that we built. Uh, we use a similar network as I mentioned, Inception. Uh, and um, our early results weren't great. I mean, yes, we picked out the tumor, but it was triggering on all of these nonspecific things that, you know, that wasn't right. Um, so we actually spent a lot of time uh, refining the model and, until we got this sort of uh, quiet region here. Uh, and so the reason why we think this is really important is uh, to help the pathologist, what you really want to do is help localize the tumor. It's not enough to just say, hey, you know, we think that there's tumor here. Um, the pathologist won't believe you until you show them where it is, right? Um, and then also, what if it's a negative slide? You know, what do you do? Do you just tell them it's a negative slide? Well, wouldn't the pathologist still look over the slide to make sure that it is truly negative? So have you just done nothing for the pathologist? Anyway, so we figured that the uh, locali localization score was really what we wanted to um, optimize here. And so uh, there's a well-known localization score called FROC, uh, and it's a measure of how well you can pick out where the tumors are. Uh, and the algorithm that we finally trained had an FROC of 0.89, um, 
versus uh, 0.73 for a pathologist who, were able, who had unlimited time with the slides. Now, um, like all metrics, this metric, the FROC metric, is not perfect. Um, what, a, what the FROC really meant was that at 92% sensitivity and at eight false positives per slide, uh, or the algorithm had 92% sensitivity at eight false positives per slide, whereas the pathologist had 73% sensitive sensitivity with zero false positive per slide. So if you imagine putting those two systems together, where you would have really a really sensitive system with very low false positives, and that's actually um, where this algorithm would be the most useful in clinical care. So um, I've talked about a couple examples of how um, deep learning has been applied at Google to uh, medical problems, but um, we recently open sourced our framework for AI called TensorFlow. Uh, and uh, there's been a lot of other uh, academic universities, um, et cetera, that have been using TensorFlow for a variety of applications, one of which uh, was for skin cancer. And this was done, work done out of Stanford. Um, and similarly, they were able to show that they were able to train um, a deep learning uh, algorithm that is able to classify images of melanoma, so their dermoscopy pictures, um, and, uh, and I think actually also non-dermoscopy pictures, um, at a sensitivity and specificity that rivals that of a dermatologist. Um, and this is extremely exciting because um, they actually also use the network that the cats and dogs network, the inception network. They use the same one and use very similar methods uh, to get this to work. So uh, uh, I imagine that there will be a lot more of these technologies um, coming up, a lot more of these papers um, that show how well uh, deep learning will work for, for medicine. Okay, so I hope I have shown a few examples of how deep learning has shown promise um, for building assistive tools for doctors. But the question is, what next? We've shown that these algorithms work very accurately uh, in, in silico, almost. Um, but the next part is, as I alluded to, clinical validation. So clinical trials, clinical studies, showing that this actually works in the clinic. Um, the thing that we uh, kind of over, uh, well, I don't think we can emphasize enough is building trust uh, between the algorithm and you know, whatever technologies and tools we put out and also the clinical community. So one of the things that is really important is uh, talking about where, why this algorithm is making the prediction it is. So uh, maybe creating heat maps or other types of things uh, that will help you um, uh, explain to the doctor or help the tool explain to the doctor uh, what is being used to make this prediction. And of course, the last part, which is uh, workflow and user design. So uh, doctors are really busy in many parts of the world. They're seeing hundreds of patients a day. And so whatever tool you give them has to essentially fit into their workflow existing. You can't you know, uproot everything. Um, and so we actually have a group of folks um, that don't do machine learning at all. And what they do is they look at user design. They look at um, how people interact with that tool. So that screenshot I showed of Arda, there were user design experts that went through and said, you know, how do we uh, make this uh, uh, software, piece of software, as usable as possible? Okay, so I'm done with a portion about the work that we do in our group. Um, I'm sure some of you might be curious on how I got here because at some point I was just like you guys, um, a medical student and uh, so I'm gonna give you the first, I'm gonna give you the official version. Uh, so I graduated from um, Stanford University and I had, uh, I did my, I was majored in chemical engineering uh, and I did my pre-med um, and uh, I went to UCSF, it's a university in San Francisco, for my MD PhD where I did my PhD in bioengineering, um, nanotubes uh, for drug delivery was my PhD thesis. And then uh, from there, I worked at a startup called, uh, called Doximity, which is essentially a LinkedIn for physicians. Uh, and then from there, I ended up uh, joining Google to run uh, a um, telemedicine product, essentially, that eventually shut down. Um, and uh, then I went on to work for search and research. So looking at this timeline, I'm sure some of you guys are like, that doesn't make any sense. <laughs> How did you jump from here to there? Um, and so, Actually, um, I think if I explain a little bit more about the sort of off the books or unofficial things that I've been doing, a lot of this kind of, I think, makes more sense. So um, the story behind my MD-PhD 
was that I actually really wanted, was really enamored with the idea of um, bench to bedside. So the idea of taking some sort of breakthrough scientific technology and translating it to something that um, would be used with the patient at the bedside. And so I thought, well, the MD-PhD, at, at, in the States it's two years of, it's, well, it's four years in total medical school and then three or more years of the PhD. Um, I thought that was the perfect way of kind of, you know, going after that goal. Um, but during my PhD, PhD years, I also ended up realizing that in order to, for this translation to really happen, you have to actually understand the business behind these products, right? So you can, there are lots of great technologies out there, but they never make it to the bedside because there's not a real business that is built behind it, not a real plan about how to um, put this into the market. And so I actually spent some time um, in business plan competitions with a couple of my friends in grad school. And um, we ended up, we had a great mentorship and then ended up winning a few of them. And from there, uh, we, oops, let's go back. Oops. And from there, we actually uh, did a, ended up forming a startup uh, toward the end of my, um, my, my PhD called Nano Precision Medical, where we basically used um, my PhD as a, a stepping stone. It's, again, it's drug delivery using nanopart or nanotubes. Um, and so my colleagues, my co two co-founders are still actually at the company right now, and they're still working hard um, at, at the company. Um, for me, I wanted to look at other ways, essentially, that we built businesses and products. And so I did a series of internships um, in my downtime in medical school. So between my PhD and my, uh, my going back to get my clinicals, I did an internship at a VC firm, and then I also um, ended up starting at, at Doximity as an intern my fourth year. Um, and that's when I got my full-time job, was at Doximity because of this internship. And of course, at Doximity, I was a product manager there. Um, and uh, I, instead of, so I also engaged in some side activities in terms of looking through the database that we had, and we actually published a paper about you know, the outcomes of medical students um, that enroll and then versus the outcomes, um, how, they, how they look after they graduate. Uh, so we spent some, I spent some time doing that. Um, and then that's when I started off at Google. And of course at Google, I was doing a bunch of 20% projects. At Google, there's, um, you're encouraged to spend about 20% of your time working on something that's not core to what you do. And so, in fact, the Diabetic Retinopathy Project was a 20% project. It was a few engineers and I, we decided that oh, this seems like a really worthwhile thing to do, and we, so we started off as a 20% and got enough um, support from our managers and, and directors that we ended up having this a full-time effort that then uh, grew. So that was kind of long, <laughs> but um, I think uh, when I was going through this process, um, I definitely didn't really realize what I was doing. Uh, I, it, but I think in hindsight, there were a few lessons that I learned in the process that I think may be really somewhat helpful. They may also be platitudes, so you can ignore them too. Um, so the most important thing I realized was uh, make the most out of your medical school or graduate school status, like, um, or graduate student status. Um, I think once you graduate um, and you actually have more responsibilities, um, a lot of people, uh, they don't treat you the same way, right? So right now, you're meant to learn. You can ask all the questions you want. You can explore. You can you find mentorship everywhere you go. Everyone wants to mentor smart, bright, young, you know, uh, medical or graduate students. But once you start, you know, um, in your full-time job, uh, it's some of these opportunities are a little bit more closed, and you don't have the flexibility to because um, uh, you have a real primary job that you have to you have to go uh, and function as. And of course, um, uh, I. Yeah, making friends was really important for me because uh, most of my network and the people that I work with, my co-founders, my startup, they were all my friends. Uh, and these are, you know, your classmates are the ones that are really going to help you guys um, get stuff done once you guys graduate from med school. Um, one of the things I uh, did a lot when I was doing all these side projects was I failed. Um, and I think the trick is to fail quickly uh, so that you don't spend too much time on something that isn't, isn't going to work. And it's actually part of your PhD training. You fail a lot, uh, and then you get discouraged, and then eventually they kick you out. <laughs> um, <laughs> and um, the last part is don't be afraid to start from zero again and again and again. And in each of these experiences I had, um, I went from you know someone who I 
well, I thought I knew what I was doing. And I went to a new experience and I was like, I have no idea what I'm doing. Uh, and this is, um, I think, exactly the experience and this is why I think doing the side projects are really important because um, that's how you kind of learn. Uh, and so, you know, every experience, my first job at Doximity, my first job at Google, I felt like I knew nothing. Um, but don't be afraid to do that because if you feel like you know everything, then you should probably go do something else because <laughs> you're not getting anything out of this. Um, okay, I think that's it. Thank you so much for that engaging talk, Willis. We're so lucky to have you and to have you down in Sydney to explore a little bit. Can I just have another round of applause for Lily? Uh, just a reminder, you can come down to use the mics um, that are in their stairwells here and then send some questions in through the app. So we have a question uh, from the app. Someone was wondering how quickly these uh, um, technologies can be translated into clinical practice and whether you think we'll be using them when we're practicing in a couple of years. Yeah, um, I, certainly, I certainly hope so. Uh, so, um, you know, the bottleneck for um, these technologies is, uh, is not really, I mean, training them and gathering the data, it's, it, is, it is difficult. Um, uh, it takes a lot of time to actually gather the label data. The training itself of the algorithms actually in proportionally don't take as much time. Um, what I think is takes longer time is essentially getting these products um, approved by regulators uh, through the clinical validation. You don't want to skimp there. You want to do everything right. Uh, and so typically, uh, this is a medical device. In the US, this is a medical device. And typically, medical devices of this class, of this same risk of, uh, profile, takes about five years on average to um, uh, get into the clinic. And even though I believe that the technology behind this is pretty revolutionary, um, it's still a medical device and it's still software, image analysis software. And image analysis software has been around for quite some time. Uh, and um, you know, it, it's usually around you know, on the average five years to kind of get some of these uh, into the market. So I don't know if you guys have heard of uh, you know, the assistive uh, image analysis advice for uh, mammography, which is uh, called, there's some, it doesn't work super well, but it's, it's, there's similar stories with uh, thin prep and with um, image checker. So that's, well, that's the one for mammography, and thin prep is the one for cervical cancer. These are all image analysis software that essentially went through the same pathway with the FDA, and technologies like these will end up um, probably doing the same. Yeah, awesome. Do you think that it, the process is too slow or it's about the right amount um, of time? No, I think uh, with any new technology, you need to prove that these are clinically relevant metrics that you're improving. Uh, and so um, I, don't, I don't know if it's too slow. I think it's good to be cautious. I think it's good to produce the evidence. And sometimes when you're enrolling trials prospectively, it's just, that's just the amount of time it takes. So, yeah, yeah, fair enough. Um, just from number two. Hi, um, I'm Cyril, fourth year UCID student. Um, I think what you've basically shown is something that's really, really good if you're working together with a trained, uh, trained doctor. So they both work in very different and very complementary methods. Mm -hmm. But as time go on, have you, have you ever received or do you envision ever receiving any sort of pushback from the medical profession as in very many other professions, the concept of automation is very negatively viewed? Yeah, yeah, that's a good question. Um, so um, I think it's really hard to think about doctors as one unit because there's such differing opinions. Um, I think a majority of doctors, uh, I can't speak for everyone, but a majority of doctors like technology, embrace technology, right? Um, smartphone adoption with doctors are, is extremely high. I think doctors are practical. I think they're into tools that help them and they want to see evidence that this is helpful. Uh, and so that's our jobs, I think, as people who are in this industry to produce evidence that this is helpful and helpful for their patients. And I think that's when doctors will appreciate um, the tools that are built um, for them. Um, so if, if you're not doing that, then I think that, you know, that, uh, well, you, you shouldn't, should not expect a doctor to embrace technologies where you don't have clinical evidence that this is helpful for patients. But if you do, I think most doctors are very excited to have um, uh, assistive tools, essentially, that make them you know, perform better, make them like MacGyver. I mean, that's pretty cool, so. Uh, 
Uh, we'll just go to number one quickly. Good morning, Lily. Thank you for coming. Um, I just had a question. What do you think, um, or what, where do you see the future of specialties such as, say, pathology or dermatology, which is such an image-based analysis as sort of the core of that specialty? Can you repeat the question again? Sorry, I didn't miss the beginning. So for, um, for specialties such as, say, pathology, mm -hmm. dermatology, radiology, mm -hmm. um, with assisted computer-assisted learning, mm -hmm. um, what do you see for the future of these specialties? Uh, for these specialties? Well, so I think, um, like I mentioned, image analysis algorithms aren't really new, and doctors are used to having assistance uh, to help them basically uh, pick out the, the things that need their attention, right? So if you think about radiology, you think about all these other places, and biopsies especially, you get a lot of normals, right? And doctors at some point, they get tired of being just lesion detectors. And so um, in general, I think what these technologies allow you to do is um, focus your attention on the abnormals, so the places where they're, that require your attention, the patients that require more of your attention, and then you get to spend more time with those patients. Um, and so I think, if anything, this will um, hopefully give doctors um, more uh, time back in focusing on um, the, the patients that need them the most. Do you think that there are specialties that young medical students should be cautious about entering? Not really. I mean, to be honest, I think you should do Pick a specialty that you love doing, like the, the patience, the work, is, is what you kind of would like to do uh, for the rest of your life. Uh, and, um, and, and be prepared that, I mean, every specialty will change. Um, not because of AI, because of many other things. So in radiology, for example, in the US, we have um, um, the government instituted something called appropriate use criteria, where essentially and they're saying you have to go through um, uh, go through the checklist to see if this is uh, this radiology image is appropriately um, ordered, right? Um, so you're going to see at some point the volume and the balance of images change. Um, the type of reading will change because depending on how you know, regulators approach this area. Um, or in the U.S., we had electronic medical records that came out, and so now doctors have to spend a lot of time in front of a camera, uh, or not a camera, uh, a computer, doing essentially data entry. Um, so. Uh, I think the practice of medicine will change over time, uh, and if you love what you do and you love the patient population and the problems that you're solving, like these other things won't matter as much, uh, and you'll adapt to the tools that they give you. These are just tools that you, you're given, um, and so you'll adapt to that. Yeah, that's a really good point. It's kind of inevitable, so it's just being ready to, yeah, flow with the punches. Um, number two. Hi, um, I'm Elise from UQ. I was just wondering, you said that the inspiration for some of your technology came from the situation in India. Do you think that the cost and the equipment required for these kinds of technologies uh, means that it is actually viable to implement them in countries that already have limited health resources? Yes, absolutely. Um, I should give you money for planting that question. <laughs> it's a really good question. Um, and um, actually, I think uh, technologies like this, uh, because it's, so if you think about it, we train an algorithm that delivers consistent, high-quality care. Uh, it never gets tired. Uh, it runs on, you know, I don't know, like really cheaply all the time, 24-7. That's the type of tool that really allows you to democratize medicine no matter where you are, no matter you know, how much, well, almost no matter how much money you can make, right? Um, and uh, in rural communities and underserved communities where um, I think there are a lot of populations that have, I mean, essentially been forgotten, uh, this is where you can deliver you know, the same high quality care um, consistently across populations. So this is incredibly, I think, incredibly powerful, and one of the reasons why we were so excited to do this, um, just because of the ability uh, that this will scale, essentially beyond. Um, and so, you know, you you can. I mean, one of the hardest things about rural populations is getting one, getting doctors uh, to serve the rural populations, but also for the doctors to see enough of the of rare cases or enough patient volume so they don't get rusty, right? Uh, and so. Uh, when you have an algorithm like this where uh, it's basically learned on the knowledge of 54 ophthalmologists and you know, have seen 130,000 of the same case, you see this consistent care uh, and this knowledge um, that, uh, that, uh, that powers the algorithm. So um, this is exactly the reason why I think um, we're so excited about what we're doing.
Yeah, just to follow up on that, there's actually a question from the app from someone calling themselves Public Health Forever. Um, <laughs> <laughs> they wanted to know if there is money flowing into uh, kind of ne neglected tropical diseases or kind of under-resourced or issues that are more prominent in under-resourced areas, or is that something that's lacking? Um, so uh, I can answer the question sort of for our research group. Um, our research group, um, we do prioritize uh, problems. So, um, just to give you a little context, we're a group of computer scientists, doctors, uh, and so uh, we, our superpower, for a lack of a better word, is applying sort of our expertise to very certain problems. Um, and we're specifically very interested in problems where uh, there, are, uh, there are ways that we can help um, an underserved population that you know, would otherwise not get this kind of help. Um, and so that's one of the reasons why diabetic retinopathy was chosen. Um, there are, other, there are other, way, uh, other problems out there where um, I think there's a nice mixture of our expertise and uh, so our ability to help and the, then, and the clinical problem. And that, you know, that Venn diagram is kind of what we try to uh, go after. So uh, in terms of, yes, that is prioritized. Um, globally as a whole, I, I'm not sure, but I would imagine that um, uh, there are a lot of foundations who would be interested in, in this kind of stuff. Awesome, yeah. Just at number one, two over there. Uh, hi, Dr. Peng. Um, thank you for coming. I'm Chris from Uni of New South Wales. So just for a few more career questions, I guess, um, on whether you actually have a lot of uh, physician experience, because I realized that you just jumped into all these business internships. And also, say, do you have any career experience in coding, for example? Because as a, a student who is really into med and tech, um, I would like to know what is the most optimal pathway to br actually break into the industry? Thank you. So, uh, actually, let me get the question again. I think it's because it's there's yeah. an echo. There's a bit of an echo. So yeah. I think he was just asking, um, in terms of getting into tech, where did you get your coding experience and what kind of or your programming background? Is that right? Yes. Yeah. And also, if you you have like a lot of physician experience too to pad up to it and stuff. Yeah. The, oh, the third. Okay. So, um, so uh, just a disclaimer. I don't code. So you guys will hear from a product manager at Google who does code. He's in the audience right there, Jack Poe, and he'll be on later on. I do not code. Um, and uh, one of the things I do for the team is actually I try to identify the clinical problems and I try to use my sort of scientific background to guide the team. Um, and so I think that you know something like this, I don't think you necessarily need to code um, to make a difference, but clearly being able to think scientifically and understand and communicate with engineers is really important. So if you can do that yourself, that's amazing. Um, and so I would definitely encourage you to, to do that, um, to play with TensorFlow uh, and, and just at least get your feet wet and understanding, it, um, not necessarily just the coding, the active, like the programming language itself, but the in intellectual framework about um, um, how you set up an algorithm, for example, like that type of thinking, that type of problem solving, more so than just you know learning Python, you know, uh, commands uh, yourself. Um, and so, I would say yes, please, you know, spend a lot of time understanding the computer, like the framework of com computer science. Um, uh, for as for getting into internships, um, for me, uh, I. Ended up actually just whenever there was an internship opportunity that seemed interesting, um, a lot of times actually it was through my friends that were like, "Hey, you know, there's this really interesting opportunity. Um, you know, did you do you are you interest are you interested in doing more?" Um, that's how I actually got a lot of my internships. It was through my friends who had done them before, um, and so this is not that's. I'm sorry, my advice isn't more systematic. Like, you know, go to this job board and read this thing and, you know, et cetera. But I do think that for most medical students, there's a lot of opportunities that organically come. Um, and the, the more you say yes to these opportunities, assuming that you have time, you don't want your studies to, you know, suffer, but the more you say yes to these opportunities, the more opportunities you have, right? So if I had not said yes to the business plan competition, I probably wouldn't have gotten the, um, the internship at the VC firm. And if I hadn't said yes to the VC firm, I probably wouldn't um, have uh, kind of known to go after uh, the, the internship at, a, at Doximity. Because one of the things I learned about my time at the VC firm was that I didn't really like just the financing of startups, I wanted to be involved in the startup. And so that's how I focused and said, okay, I'm gonna do a startup, uh, an internship at a startup because I wanted to actually do instead of fund. Um, and so that's how I started my um, Doximity internship. And then 
that's actually how I got my job at Google because they were looking for healthcare people that had experience in healthcare startups. Uh, and so that's how I actually got um, a call from, um, from uh, there was a VP of business development that, that called me um, and said, would you be interested in joining Google for this other thing? Um, and so I guess the, the, yeah, the more you say yes to um, opportunities, no matter how, um, you know, as long as it kind of goes after some of the themes that, the things that you're trying to learn, you feel like you're gonna learn something from it, then say yes to it. Um, don't worry about how much you're getting paid. Worry about how much you're learning. Getting headhunted by Google, that's uh, kind of life goals, isn't it? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, I did not realize that that was gonna happen, but yes. Um, just quickly, there's a plug. Uh, there is a breakout running. Um, there's an app for that, it's called, and mm -hmm. that's where you'll be able to talk to Jack Poe, who's the coder in the audience. Um, just one more question, sorry, and I, oh, we'll take two, so we'll just go with one first. Hi, thanks so much for coming. I uh, just wanted to ask, how do you find or choose good mentors? That is a good question. Um, so usually when you talk to a mentor, uh, one of the obvious signs is how much they talk about themselves and how much they make you talk about yourself. Uh, and how they respond to your crazy ramblings. <laughs> so. Um, some of my mentors that were excellent, uh, my PhD thesis advisor, for example, spent a lot of time just smiling and listen, listening to me while I rambled on. Uh, and then she would strategically say, it seems to me that you like this better. And I'd be like, oh, you're right, I do. Um, and of course, I've had uh, people that I considered as mentors where I, I, you know, I would say I'm sort of interested in uh, immunology, and then they go and they draw entire, you know, you know, signal processing thing, and I'm like falling asleep, and that's how I knew that they wouldn't probably wouldn't be a good mentor. Um, yeah, does that? <laughs> yeah, thank you. Just one last question. Morning. Um, I'm Errol from Notre Dame, Sydney. Uh, my question was about uh, what happens if there's conflict between the diagnosis of the artificial intelligence and the physician, mm -hmm. and are there any current areas that artificial intelligence is struggling to catch up with clinical physicians, and are there any areas that you think they'll never be able to catch up to a, a human mind? Mm -hmm. Okay, so the first part of the question, um, I think this is why um, the, these con the conflict between the um, algorithm and um, the clinicians is exactly why ex what we call explainability is really important. So the idea that the algorithm, algorithm will then explain to the doctor why it arrived at a certain diagnosis, right? Um, and so it's one of those things that we're very actively doing research in. It's a sort of a newer area. Um, but it's the same thing. It's if you are a junior doctor and you come up with a diagnosis, one of the reasons, uh, one of the things that you should be able to do is explain to your attending or your senior doctor uh, why you made a decision. It's no different from an algorithm. Uh, and uh, what if the algorithm is able to do that, then obviously the physician can say, you have a faulty, you know, there's a, there's a fault in your reasoning. I, I, I understand where you're, why you made this diagnosis, but it's wrong. I'm gonna go with my own thing, right? Um, or, you know, you brought, bring up a good point. Uh, I think that I, I was wrong. Uh, so that's, that's, I think, the key to that part. Um, as for where, uh, where com these computer algorithms, where they're not gonna, they haven't caught up with doctors, is uh, what we call, um, uh, well, one-shot learning or learning um, from fewer examples. So if you give a typical medical student, um, you know, 10, 20 examples, they get the idea. In fact, after a few examples, you're like, okay, I really understand this, stop, right? Um, with algorithms, the one that we trained, we, we told it 130,000 times that this is what you're learning. Learn by example, right? Uh, and so that's one of the, the, one of the, also the holy grails of, um, of, uh, of medicine, or of uh, deep learning or machine learning is what do you do with small data sets? Like there's not a lot of examples. Uh, um, I think that's one of the things that I, I haven't seen um, anything that um, is promising enough to think that uh, it would be, you know, Matt, would rival uh, the human being's ability to learn. Uh, that was just such an interesting session. Can everyone give another round of applause to Dr. Payne? Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you.